If there is no hope left, then why not live in harmony with despair and enjoy the end of the trip? Watching Made in Abyss and Girls' Last Tour together. Man oh man, I won't ever trust these wolves in sheep's clothing anymore. These two anglerfish-type genre works show their hideous faces because of the closeness of their broadcast times, plus the fact that they both attract viewers through the brilliance of their cute surfaces. Aside from these two points, they don't have any similarities in the core of their stories, and can even be considered the opposite. The characters in Made in Abyss are full of courage to dive into the unknown abyss in the embrace of mysterious nature, and the characters in Girls' Last Horror wander aimlessly in the steel forest to the upper level. One is full of excitement along with positivity to basically commit suicide, while the other is pessimistic along with desperation in order to survive. Although Made in Abyss is based deep underground, the surrounding environment is vibrant, the plot is quite compact, and is overall in a pleasant atmosphere. Girls' Last Horror is a cold loneliness surrounded by only snow, as well as abandoned buildings, and the rare green they see along the way is only a fantasy or man-made. The biggest difference is the motivations of the characters, Riko has a very clear purpose, to go to the bottom to find her mother. Chito and Yuri have no purpose in themselves. They want to reach the top, and so why do they do it? The process of finding other human beings, getting food, or perhaps moving to the upper level is the real meaning. If they don't do this, then they may even lose their reason to live. With a post-apocalyptic theme, to survive in a world where human civilization is seriously declining, it is not uncommon for these types of works to have these selling points. Some of them also add some kind of creation instead of humans that stand at the top of the food chain, turning the post-apocalyptic ruins into a blood-boiling battle to extend the life and increase the appreciation of the work. Girls' Last Horror is not obsessed with the description of a post-apocalyptic world. On the contrary, the work is too calm in regards to despair. The ground is obviously full of destructive weapons, and the life of the two heroines is also very difficult, but there is no fear or anger from their tones as if they have long been used to this feeling. The background of the story is not during the disaster, but after. It belongs to the post-apocalyptic genre plus the road movie genre expressed in Kino's journey as it reflects on life through experience on the road and satirizes the human beings of the past. In the first episode of the story, you can see the general direction. Just a second ago, Yuri, who was dreaming that if the world's resources for making weapons could be used to solve the food problem, then there would be no wars. In the next second, pointed the gun at Chito's head when she faced the fact that the resources could not be distributed evenly. In addition, there are also close-ups of the two bullets. When there is a shortage of food and an excess of bullets, it is necessary to separate the two bullets from other bullets for storage purposes, in which the only reason for them to do this is that they can choose their own death date. The author's hints can be seen from the clothing and race of the two. Chito's helmet is the Brody helmet from Great Britain, and Yuri's helmet is a Stahlhelm made in Germany, a symbol of Germany-United Kingdom relations. Chito's image is more in line with being East Asian, while Yuri is more in line with being European and American. These two species have different personality traits depending on the culture they were born in, which is used in the anime as a metaphor for modern humans and postmodern humans. Chito is a typical modern human being who will maintain respect for traditional culture with an innate sense of identity for the religion and mission left by the previous generation. So in this era, when human civilization has completely declined, she is still enthusiastic about learning and writing a diary to record information. Even if the information is of no use to the revival of humanity, she still fulfills her mission in the face of the reality that everything has been reduced to nothingness. This gives Chito the impression of being very mature most of the time, as she hasn't completely fallen into despair, and she wants to try to at least struggle. Yuri, as a postmodern human, has a more liberal nature and follows pragmatism. To her, anything that doesn't help them survive is no different from garbage, and she's more interested in a pack of rations than a library that records the entire history of mankind. She doesn't care about being alive or dead. What she considers is what she can eat today, when she can eat, and how many chances left she can eat. Thus, that's why Yuri can laugh out loud. Abandoning everything will naturally not be stressful. Instead, it will be easier and more suitable for humans living in this environment. Two people with very different personalities go on a journey just like this, enjoying things that we never pay attention to in our daily lives, never experiencing heaven, thus treating every day as a dream. From the previous Dark Magical Girls genre, it can be seen that the suffering of young girls can better resonate with the viewers. In Girls' Last Tour, they do not show their own pain, Naive ideas meets cruel reality. The real suffering in this anime are us viewers. These two underage children. Wait, they're 20? Well, nutritional deficiencies lead to slow growth. I guess it makes sense. 
From the perspective of the continuation of human civilization and the perspective of sociology, it is impossible to revive human civilization with only two children, so it is time for the third character to appear. The first person they met was a man named Kanazawa. Encountering a complete stranger in a usual doomsday work when the resources for survival are seriously insufficient is the time for a survival war. However, this conflict ended soon, and everyone dropped their guard, setting off toward the upper levels. This doesn't mean how selfless the two sides are, it's just that they both accept their own destiny. Kanazawa was traveling on a motorcycle with another woman, now he is the only one left. Yuri and Chito can still accompany each other, living alone in that world which will sooner or later be swallowed up by a despair called loneliness. Like Chito and others who travel to the upper floors, Kanazawa relied on the goal of drawing a map as his pillar of mind. When that pillar shattered, he died. At the end of the third episode, Kanazawa did not travel with the two girls. Maybe he had realized the importance of transportation in the city. Adding one more person means more limited space for storing resources, and food consumption would be more severe. There really isn't enough room on the small boat to support the weight of a third person. Although he claims to be remapping the new city, he gives Chito his most important camera as he embarks on his last journey, trying to measure the distance between now and the end of their lives. In episode 6, another third person, a woman named Ishii appeared. Her motives are even more exaggerated, as she wants to build a plane herself in order to fly out to other cities to seek that glimmer of hope. Because the aspect ratio of the aircraft is too large, the fuselage is too thin, and the strength of the plane is not enough, it would logically crash as a result. Whether it's a map or an airplane, both are human explorations of new fields. These two people tried their best to continue the history of mankind, and take on the responsibility that does not belong to them, the revival of mankind. In the moment of failure, realizing their own limit, human beings had tried their best. Humanity's demise is already doomed, and what they did was just to verify this. Now that there are two witnesses to get the answer, instead of being sad, it's a bit more relaxing. The only hope left is gone, and now it is time to live in harmony with despair. Sometimes the word scares is worse than having nothing at all, as it can lead to superfluous expectations. Sooner or later, this fragile expectation will be betrayed by reality. Looking back on everything in the past, most of what Chito and Yuri got were leftovers. The last potato, fuel, as well as nothing but bullets were plentiful. In episode 9, they meet the last fish and two robots that are still alive. These robots continue carrying out the mission they have been following since birth, but the giant robot had a bug in its execution commands. In order to make the last fish live longer, Yuri and them have to destroy the robot. Despite this, the giant robot is performing the task of protecting humans, not continuing until Yuri had successfully planted a bomb on it, as well as witness the safe departure and continuance of the two humans. In this way, the surviving robots are also the only ones left. The last thing they encounter in the anime is a strange creature they call Nuko. Its appearance is similar to those of the gods on the sculpture. Its body is petite and its food sources are all over the place. It is the third creature most suitable for carrying on this trip, and has been accompanying them until the last episode. The montage in this episode expresses humans' past culture, the prosperity plus decline of history vividly, and there is finally an understanding of why humans in the past worshipped Nuko as a god. This god is a judge born from the earth, with its real form like a fungus. According to them, they will not eat human beings that are alive, and were born to process things that are calorically unstable turning them into a more stable state. There were broken buildings all along the way, but no one's body could be seen. They were all classified as non-living people, including the two humans they had encountered before. Eliminating unstable energy sources is a perfect reason. Now that life is almost completely extinct, these unstable energy sources can hardly pose a threat to other life or nature. On the contrary, those energy sources, which are the most important resources for human rejuvenation, have just disappeared like this. As gods, they do not have any aggressiveness towards human beings. They just realize that it's better to accelerate the decline of existing civilization than to rebuild human civilization, so that the next cycle of this earth can start earlier. Human beings are at last decreed in tender voices of their own end by the gods they worship. Through some of the remaining communication equipment, the gods use their singing to call upon their own kind to embellish the twilight of mankind, once again giving Chito her scarce hope before they fall asleep waiting for the next civilization to arrive, with there being no human beings anywhere but within the highest layers, forcing them to travel again. But for these two girls, as long as they are together, the end of the human race doesn't matter. The ending of the anime stays in a positive place, as the girls embark on a journey once again like the beginning, 
which is a central idea that this work is emphasizing, the beginning and the end. Throughout the entire anime, you can always experience a sense of contrast. The cruel reality contrasts with the naive characters, realistic weapons with cute characters. In episode 5, they use their helmets and cans as musical instruments in order to play the last human created music through the rain. Perhaps our ancestors also discovered a culture called music by staying in caves when it rained and they couldn't go out hunting. In the manga, Chito and Yuri created the last human drawings, which are the only animals they hunted, as well as known, the fish. This portrait hangs next to the first cave paintings known to man. The original human culture is also the last human culture. Nature is a huge cycle. Compared with the ending of the anime, the plots in the later parts of the manga really gave me a kind of exquisite despair. There may be some spoilers in the next part. In fact, the author himself had already spoiled all the manga endings at the beginning of the anime, and there are not many plots left, so production can barely make another season of anime. Even if it gets spoiled, it doesn't really matter. In the latter parts of the manga, the countdowns of the journey of the two began. When the problem of food shortage became more and more serious, their mind is clouded by physical exhaustion. The half-track's lifespan is up, losing its ability to transport. The two people transform it into a bathtub for one last soap. The originally mature Chito collapsed completely, and the two embraced each other. They already knew where they were going. Chito thanked Yuri for everything in the past, and walked up with what they could bring. The intersection between life and death began to blur. They weren't sure if they could open their eyes after closing them this time. Gradually, they dropped the gun to save weight, leaving only two bullets. They burned unread books, which would throw away their futures. Then, they also tore the diary and threw it into the fire, sacrificing their past. The two girls started to fade away their proof of being human in order to live a little longer. At last, they reached the uppermost level, where there was nothing but a sky full of stars. What surrounded them was white snow. Not worrying about something falling on them, they took off their helmets. Not worrying about the future, they cherished the present. Like in the anime ending song created by the author, the two started snowball fights, ate the last bit of their food, then laid down and fell asleep together. Things in the future should be considered in the future with the world falling into silence after the sentence. This is the end of the manga, an open ending with a predestined fate. Some readers may think they are reincarnated in Shimeji Simulation, the author's other manga, but I think the most suitable ending for the two girls is the scene of the two standing within the rice field in the last scene of the manga. There are many sayings about the afterlife in Japan. The most famous one is the Sanzu River in Hell Girl. The dark red sky and the red spider lily, also known as the flower of the heavens, blooming by the river. In Girls' Last Horror, Chito and Yuri faced the golden waves, where there was no hunger, no despair. The two girls finally reached the place of their dreams, falling asleep together with hope.